Thank you for joining us this year for our Virtual Developer Summit. My name is Ann Fitz, and I'm a product engineer on the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. I'm here with two of my colleagues, Christian Ekenes, who is also a product engineer on the JavaScript API, and Russ Roberts, who is a product engineer on ArcGIS Online. Today, we're going to talk to you about dynamic vector symbology and how you can use it in the JavaScript API. All of the slides and demos for this presentation will be available at this link here, arcg.is slash 1stzgk0. So first, I'll just briefly go over the agenda for today's session. We'll start out by talking about sim symbols and how to create these symbols from scratch. Then I'll pass it off to Russ, who will talk to us about creating a web style and how you can use these symbols in your apps. And finally, Christian will talk to us about how you can use your data to drive your SIM symbols. All right, so first, what are SIM symbols? You might have heard of SIM before. It stands for the Cartographic Information Model. And under the hood, it's what we've used to define symbols in ArcGIS Pro for a while now. We brought support for SIM point symbols to the JavaScript API at version 4.12, and support for SIM lines and polygons at version 4.16. So you might have some initial questions about SIM symbols. Why should I use these symbols over other symbols provided in the API? And what makes these symbols unique? Well, in a lot of situations, the other symbols in the API might work well for you if you just need a simple point, line, or polygon symbol. Then I recommend using those symbols that are provided out of the box in the API. But if you are looking for a symbol that you can completely customize to your liking, then the SIM symbol is what you're looking for. SIM symbols are high quality vector symbols that look good at any scale. For example, see this image comparing a scaled vector symbol to a scaled image. The vector symbol will look crisp at any zoom level. So probably one of the most important feature of the SIM symbol is its symbol layers. Symbol layers are the building blocks of SIM symbols, and they combine to make rich graphical depictions. You can configure the shape, color, texture, size, position, etc. of each symbol layer, and then combine these symbol layers to create your desired symbol. For example, we can see that the symbol here is a kind of globe shape with a number on it. And if we break it down into its symbol layers, there are three of them. One layer for the number text, one layer for the blue circle, and then one layer for the small gray marker at the bottom of the symbol. Each of these symbol layers has unique properties set on it to define what it looks like and where it's placed in the final symbol, giving users total control over what their symbol will look like. Finally, the last thing I want to mention is primitive overrides. This is a property on the sim symbol that allows you to dynamically update the attribute of an individual symbol layer in Arcade, using Arcade. So for example, in this image, you can see that the inner green circle, the size of that increases as the amount of forested area increases, but the outer gray circle remains the same. This is the magic of primitive, primitive overrides. You can be very specific in how you want your symbol to look based on your data. Your data. And Christian will talk to us more about this later. Okay, so now that we've talked about all the things that make the SIM symbol great, the next question you might have is, how can I get started? How can I use this in the API? So the SIM symbol is a symbol class, and any place that we support using symbols in the API, like for a graphic or for rendering a layer, it's fair game to use the SIM symbol. Creating a SIM symbol is a bit different than other symbols, though. There's just one main property that you should use to define your symbol, and that's the data property. SIM symbols are based on the type SIM symbol reference in the SIM spec and are written in JSON. The SIM spec should be your go-to guide when creating SIM symbols, 
and it has all the information you need and conveniently links to the different properties you'll need to create your symbol. So here you can see this is the sim symbol reference, which is what that data property is based off of. And then we can click through the links to get more information about what type of symbols are available. And if we go to sim point symbol, what properties do I need to specify to set that point symbol? So let's go back to the slides. Um, so the data type for sim symbol will always be the sim symbol reference. And then the symbol property will be where you define your symbol. In this case, we're looking at a sim line symbol. And then that's also where you'll define your symbol layers that we mentioned previously. Lastly, you can set the primitive overrides here. The other way you can use sim symbols in our API is through web style symbols. Web style symbols are predefined 2D sim symbols that you can conveniently reference in your apps. Let's take a look at this guide page in our documentation. So there, these are the symbols that we provide out of the box. And to use one of these symbols in your app, you have two options. You can either reference this web style symbol when you are bringing in your symbol, and you can easily just copy and paste it right here. Or you can use the sim symbol, which gives this much longer snippet, but will give you access to change properties of the symbol, like if you wanted to update the size or update the color. So comparing, comparing these two snippets can really help you see how useful a web, a web style can be in saving time for creating these symbols. All you have to do is just copy the name and style name versus this long, long thing. And you can also create your own web style symbols and publish them for use in your apps. And this is something that Russ will tell us more about later in the presentation. So to show you all that's possible with sim symbols, I thought it would be best to go through each symbol type and talk about the symbol layers that are supported on that type. Then to create your symbol, you can use any combination of the symbol layers that I mentioned here. Let's start with the sim point symbol. There are three main things we wanna point out here. And the first is this sim picture marker symbol layer. This is created from a raster image file and allows you to bring images into your symbols, like I did with this Esri logo here. Next, we have the sim vector marker symbol layer, which represents vector graphics. It's constructed from a collection of marker graphics, which are geometries and symbols that are used as building blocks for the marker. So for this symbol shown here, this would actually be comprised of two different symbol layers. One symbol layer would be this blue pin, which would, they're both sim vector marker symbol layers. So one would be this blue pin and the other would be this gray base. But then this blue pin symbol would be constructed of two different marker graphics, one that's creating the pin and one that's cutting out the hole in the center. Lastly, though this is not a symbol layer on its own, I wanted to point out that you can add text to your symbols through the sim text symbol. This is supported as a marker graphic on the sim vector marker symbol layer. Next, let's talk about line symbols. So there are two symbol layers that can be used here. Sim solid stroke, which is exactly what it sounds like, just a solid stroke of a line, and sim picture stroke where you can create a line from a picture file. Like in this case, if you were mapping Oz and you wanted to show the Yellow Brick Road. I know the sim solid stroke might not look like a lot at the first glance, but you can layer these strokes on top of each other to create unique symbols, like I did with this cased line symbol. You can also apply geometric effects to these symbol layers and have total control over how these effects are displayed. For example, you can add dashes to your line, like we do in this symbol. And with the dash geometric effect, you can specify the dash pattern you want, how long the dashes should be, etc. And in this specific example, we're also using the offset geometric effect. 
to uh, place two sets of dashed lines next to each other. I'll include the sim JSON for these symbols in the GitHub repository mentioned at the beginning of the session, just so you guys have access to them after the, after the presentation is over. So there are many other geometric effects that we support to allow you to create awesome visualizations and symbols, like with the buffer or arrows effects shown here. There are more that we support, and you'll have to go check out the sim spec for more info on those. And lastly, sim symbols support this marker placement property, where you can add one of the marker symbol layers we mentioned in the last slide and use it to create the line, like we created this line from star markers, or use it to place markers along the line, like with this blue line with small rectangles. Lastly, polygon symbols. There are three supported fill symbol layers that you can use on your polygon symbol. Sim solid fill, which just fills the polygon with a solid color. Sim hatch fill, which uses a series of parallel line symbols to create a hatched effect on the symbol. And sim picture fill, which uses an image to fill the symbol. The cool thing is that you can use everything you've learned about so far on these polygon symbols because you can use a line symbol on the polygon outline or to create unique lines for your hatch fill. And you can also use those vector markers we talked about and use the marker placement property to place those marker symbols throughout your polygon. Okay, so now that I've given you a pretty in-depth explanation of what sim symbols are, how to use them in the, JS, in the JavaScript API, and what symbol layers are available to you, let's go ahead and create a sim symbol from scratch and add it to our app. So today we're going to build a trail map for the Tahoe Rim Trail that surrounds Lake Tahoe. We have three different feature layers here. One with the actual trail, that's a line um, geometries. One that shows the trailheads that uses point geometries, and then a a layer that shows the lake boundary, which is a polygon geometry. So let's take a look at what this looks like by default without any rendering applied. Not very pretty, right? Okay, let's go back to our app and add some better symbology. Let's start with the trail symbol. Um, I'm gonna, just gonna add a symbol renderer, a simple renderer, sorry, and then we can set the symbol. So let me clean that up. Okay, so here we add a render symbol, and now we're gonna set the symbol. And the symbol property on the render allows it to be autocast. So to autocast the sim symbol, we just have to add type sim. And then we can set the data property. Now this will be where we define our symbol. I'm just gonna copy and paste some things over for for efficiency's sake. Okay, so now we have the type sim symbol reference, um, the symbol in this case, we're using a sim line symbol since this is a line geometries in this feature layer. And then now we get to add um, a symbol layer. So to add our first symbol layer, let's start with something basic, um, a sim solid stroke. And again, I'm just gonna clean that up. Okay, so here you can see we're setting the type on this to sim solid stroke. We're enabling it, so setting enable to true, which if this is not set to true, the layer will not, the symbol layer will not show up in the symbol. Um, we're setting a cap and join style on it, and we're setting the width of the symbol and a color. So this will just be a dark green stroke. Let's take a look. Nice, so we can kind of see we're, we've got this dark green stroke where that um, basic default renderer was. So now let's go ahead and add another um, symbol layer. I'm gonna add a lighter green line. I wanna add it actually before this layer so that it displays on top of it. So we'll go back and refresh. And now you can see we have kind of like a cased line property where there's this light green symbol on the inside 
and um, the darker green on the outside. And that was just very similar to the other symbol layer we had. Sim solid stroke, just a smaller width and a different color. Okay, let's add one more symbol layer to finish off this, um, this symbol. It's a bit longer. I'm gonna add it on top because I want it to show above this layer. So we're adding a white dashed layer now. And so to do that, it's the same. It's the type Sim Solid Stroke. Everything else is the same except a different width and a different color. But here we're setting an effect on the layer. So in this case, we're setting Sim Geometric Effect Dashes. So we want a dashed line and we're setting this dash template. So two, 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 two. So that's the width of the dashes and the spacing between the dashes. And you can update this to be whatever you want. And then you can also set constraints if you choose to do so for where the, the dash of the line should end and where the control point should end. So now we have this updated symbol. Let's see what it looks like. Cool, much better than that basic black line we had earlier, right? And you can see as we zoom in, this just gets clearer and clearer. It's pretty, pretty nice looking. Okay, so next we want to um, visualize the trailhead markers. Um, so we'll go to our web style symbols and there's this trail marker symbol and we can just copy and paste the name and style name of the web style symbol and we'll go back to our app. We'll add a renderer, type simple and we'll set the symbol to type web style and then we'll just paste that in. So we have the name, the style name, and that should give us the trail marker symbol on our trailheads feature layer. Let's go back to our app, back to our demo, refresh. And now you can see we have these great um, little trailhead markers at each of the trailheads. Awesome, so next, the last thing we wanna do, this green <laughs> green lake doesn't look very, very good. So let's go back to our app, and I just wanna, I'm not gonna go too into detail on this, um, but I just wanted to show you what this looks like once we add um, a, a sim polygon symbol. So I'm gonna add the renderer, I'm just copying and pasting for time's sake, clearing that up. So here I have a blue solid fill background and then I um, am adding a hatch fill on top of that with a solid stroke line symbol with dashes on it. And this dash pattern is one, two, so um, a, like a one pixel dash and then a two pixel dash. And it's a nice blue color. And then also we're adding a sim solid stroke outline around the polygon. Let's see what that looks like now. Awesome, so that looks a bit better than the bright green, right? Okay, um, next we're going to show you this cool app that's called the Sim Symbol Builder. So this app provides a simple UI that allows you to add symbol layers to your app and edit the properties of the symbol layers. Let's try it out by, um, oh, and so you have icons, you have shapes you can choose from, there's some custom symbols, you can add your own symbol JSON and then use the UI to edit it, or you can add um, a web style URL. So let's just copy and paste this web style. And we can see this is kind of the similar styles that we provide in the guide page. So let's find our hiker symbol. Okay, and now we can go in and edit our hiker symbol. So there's all these different properties here. You can open up these um, accordions and edit the colors of things in your, of the marker graphics in your layer. So say we wanna make this like um, a light blue background maybe. And let's make the size of the symbol a little bigger and let's change the color of our hiker guy and then you can also add more symbol layers so we have this symbol let's add a tree 
and so we can definitely want to bring that size of that tree down we can change the offset so it's um let's try oh that didn't work there we go moving to the left and let's move it up a little maybe change the size again we can really play around with this and then we can go move our hiker to the right a little maybe change his size a little so really this just gives you an easy way to edit your symbol and see the results immediately um, so I'm just gonna change the color of this tree just to make it a little more green okay so then you can apply to the feature layer and you can see what that symbol would look like in your feature layer so and then the coolest thing about this is that you can copy out the JSON afterward so now if I click this copy JSON it copies all of that sim symbol information and then if I go back to my app and change the symbol to type sim um, I can delete those properties and set the data to type sim symbol reference and then set the symbol to what I just copied okay now we'll go back to our app and we will refresh and now you can see that those symbols we just created in the sim symbol builder are there in our app so the sim symbol builder is a really great resource for creating sim symbols quickly um, from predefined sources and um, yeah we really hope you guys get a lot of use out of it all right so now i'm going back to the presentation and i believe it's time to pass it off to russ who will talk to us about creating a web style symbol thanks ann i'm going to show you how you can create your own web styles that you can publish to arches online or your portal to do this you're going to share a web style using arches pro 2.6 and up in this example i'll be using 2.7 Currently, we're only supporting web styles that contain symbols for points. Um, because we're using a map view, we're going to be publishing of a 2D web style, and a 2D website could support picture or shape marker symbols. Um, when we're using uh, vector symbols, like the example today, um, we'll be using just SVGs, but if you have a file that's in an EMF format, then you can use that as well with your shape marker. Um, then, um, once we publish these web styles, we could use them in web maps with like map viewer beta. Um, these web maps can then be used in other 4.x um, applications like experience builder or dashboard. Um, then the styles can also be shared for like connected maps for runtime and they can even be brought back into Pro. So let's go ahead and create a web style. Here I have Arches Pro opened up and we're looking at the Styles folder. Uh, yeah. Underneath the Styles folder, just right click, and go New, New Style. Let's give this style a name. Let's open it up and let's create a new symbol. So we start off with a classic point symbol. It's a shape marker and it's just a black dot. Let's change the color of this to white. I want to change the size to 15. For the outline, I'm going to make it a little small. And I'm going to uncheck uh, the scale proportionally. This means when the symbol gets uh, larger, if we're using like proportional symbols, the outline will stay 0 0.25. Um, if we had this checked, then the width of the outline would grow as the symbol grows. I think it adds an overall cleaner appearance to the symbol. Um, because we have multiple layers that we want to use, we can just click on Add Symbol Layer. That's going to be a marker. And then if we go back to the Layers tab, we can see that we can add a file 
here's that my example. And I'm gonna bump the size of this up to 13. And there we go, I have a simple, uh, completed multi-layer uh, shape marker symbol ready to publish up to my organization. Next, we need to go to the description tab and we need to give a name. Uh, for category, I'm just gonna call it vector. I don't need to add any new tags. And then key, which is what we'll be using later on in our sample. I'm gonna set that also to graduation so it matches the name here. Now we can go back to the styles folder, right click on our local style to publish it up as a web style. This will bring up the share as a web style pane. And we can just give it a little bit of a name, some tags. We wanna make sure that we're publishing this up as a 2D web style because we're gonna be using it in a map view. I'm gonna make sharing this to everyone so you can check it out later. And I'll just click the share button, which will start the publishing process and give us a link once the sharing has completed. Okay, now that it's done, we can now go to the item details page for the web style. Clicking on the download button will take us to the item info where we can see the name, the title, the tags. Uh, we can look at the resources or the sim info, or we can check out the thumbnail that's generated. Now, all we need to do is to use this, um, make reference to this item ID when we're going to check it out in a sample app. So here, using the proportional sized uh, web style sample, I can go down and I'm gonna be changing this section of code. It, right now it's pointing to the school POI that Esri provides, uh, swapping it out for the URL for the web style we published and using the name graduation, we can find that we're using now the web style that we've published. And if we wanted to, we could further adjust any of the colors or renderers that we're using. To talk about more data-driven SIM, here's Christian. All right, thank you, Russ, and thanks, Anne. My name's Christian Ekinis. I'm also a product engineer on the JavaScript API, and I'm gonna take some of the concepts that Anne and Russ just went over and tie them together in an example of how you can create a data-driven SIM symbol. Basically, it allows you to tie the various symbol properties of a symbol layer and override them based on data values. Before diving into the complexity of how that works, I want to take a step back and just do a quick overview of data-driven mapping in general. This is one of the core tenets of GIS web mapping or cartography in general. If you want to tell a story about data, such as census data or any attribute, really, you do it with a renderer or a style to your layer. So when I talk about data-driven mapping, what I really mean is your ability to override any symbol's visual variable with a data value. With a data value. This could be a field value in your table, or it could be an arcade expression. So if there's another attribute you want to be able to render based off of, but you don't have it in your data, you can write an expression to calculate a new value. So we've got a few examples here. One example might be wind direction. So if you have weather data and you want to visualize the direction the wind is blowing, you can override the rotation of an arrow symbol to indicate the direction the wind is blowing, as you see in that example in Australia. Or you could do size. This is a very popular way to show population. In this particular map, it's showing COVID case counts for a particular day. So I have, fundamentally, it's just a simple orange circle symbol. And then I override the size of it based off of the number of cases for a particular county. So the larger the size, the more cases there are. Then there's color, which basically does the same thing. I want to render along a continuous color ramp 
based off of a data value. In this case, it's ocean temperature or opacity that might be able to show uh, how dense an area is. If it's fully opaque, there's a higher density of flooding uh, warnings for a particular area. And if it's not very, if it's very transparent, then in this particular case, there's fewer flash flood warnings. So that's how it works on a fundamental level. Okay, now I want to switch gears and show a real world example of when you would do a simple data driven map. Recently in the United States, we had a presidential election in November of 2020. And so I was looking at some historic data in preparation of that. And while looking through the 2016 US presidential election data, I created this map, which shows the percentage of votes for a third party. And I use an above and below color ramp to show where it was higher in certain areas as compared to the national average. Nationally, about 5% of counties voted, or sorry, 5% of voters voted for a third party, which is a lot. Um, and I wanted to show the areas that voted more than that. And I came up with this pretty interesting visualization. You can see in Idaho, Utah, New Mexico, Arizona, areas where a very high percentage, Vermont as well, where they voted third party. If I look at the code to create this, I create a symbol and all, all that is involved in doing that is creating a simple fill symbol that's applied to all the features in my layer. Well, I can override any property of that symbol using visual variables. And the property I'm overriding is the fill color. So I set the type and then I wanna base it off of the percentage of votes for other parties. That's an arcade expression that allows me to do that. And then I map potential data values with colors. That's all there is to it. Well, that got me thinking and I wanted to be able to see, well, how did that voting uh, change from 2016 to 2020? And we see a lot of change maps out there, but I wanted to see it for all parties at one time in one view using a composite symbol. And that's where SIM comes into play. So a SIM symbol, with a SIM symbol, you can create a multi-part data-driven symbol. So instead of only overriding one property of the symbol, I can create a complex multi-part symbol and override individual properties of individual symbol layers. So that makes the visualization much more complex. And generally speaking, if I'm advising someone on data visualization, I would say the simpler, the better. You typically don't wanna make it more complex, but in some cases, uh, more complex can be okay and fine and really fascinating as in, as in this visualization. So I've seen maps before that cluster, that kind of have this multi-part proportional symbol going on where you have multiple circles representing one feature and the size of each circle represents a different data value. I had a user reach, reach out to me a few months ago asking about this very scenario. They had scientific data and they were mapping it out in the field and they wanted to be able to visualize how different in size each variable was altogether into a three-part symbol such as this one. Well, I wanted to take that idea and apply it to election data. So in this particular map you see here, this was the vision I had, is I wanted to have one circle representing votes for the Democrat, one circle for Republican votes, and another one for votes to third parties. And then I wanted to display visually some in some way whether those votes increased or decreased from the previous election. So not just total count, but how did it change? So you see in this image that, uh, or if you look at the legend rather in the bottom left corner, um, I decided to use a filled circle to show an increase in votes and then a hollow circle or a ring to indicate a decrease in votes. The ring kind of promotes a feeling of emptiness. So if a party lost votes, they it might kind of have this empty feeling, right? So in this image, you see um, the Atlanta area in 2020, where we saw a big increase in Democratic votes and a decrease in Republican votes, and also some increases in, in third party votes as well. So 
how do we use sim to create a visualization like this? The way you do that is with a property called primitive overrides. This is simply a property that is on the symbol, the sim symbol instance itself. So Anne already showed the structure of the sim symbol as you see here in the data. You can set the symbol and then drill down into individual symbol layers. Well, I'll show you how I created uh, this symbol using multiple symbol layers, but it's really the primitive overrides that allow you to override those symbol layer properties. And the way you do that is with Arcade Expressions. Arcade is just a client-side expression language that allows you to evaluate a set of fields and return a new number or value. In this case, you want to return the value of the primitive visual variable property. So as opposed to what I was doing before with the third-party votes, I was in that case, I was returning the percentage of the vote that voted third-party. In this case, I want to return the size of the symbol itself. So if I'm targeting a size, I want to return a size value. So I got to do that interpolation within there itself. So that's um, that's a little deep for this point, but if I want to create that symbol that you see in this slide here, I need to use primitive overrides to do it based off data values. So let's see um, how this symbol is first built. Right now, I mean, when you look at one symbol on its own, it looks like it only has three symbol layers because you have one representing either an increase or decrease in democratic votes or in the other two categories. But in reality, the symbol is composed of six symbol layers. I want to have a symbol layer for each party representing positive votes and a symbol layer for each party representing negative votes. And depending on how the voting changed from the previous election, it'll I'll use primitive overrides to display the proper symbol layer. And you can see the code over here off to the right used to create these. Right away, you, uh, you can see that I have my frame and the anchor point right here, that determines basically the offset. So um, if I want to create a democratic circle, I want to offset it um, to the left. And that's what that what this position is telling me here. And so that offset will be a little different depending on the party I'm representing. And the marker graphics, this simply is how I define the shape. So I'm just doing a circle. And then the symbol tells me what color I want to shade it. The thing with primitive overrides that's really key, so if I zoom into just the top part of that snippet and then you just look at the primitive name, that primitive name um, is essential here because you want to be able to know which layer to target for a particular data value. So with each symbol layer, I'm naming it something distinctive. So you can see all of the primitive names in that image above. I have Democrat positive votes and Democrat negative votes, Republican positive, Republican negative, and so on and so forth. All right, so here's that snippet you saw before where it shows the primitive overrides and the symbol layers. What I if you look at the snippet off to the right, however, you'll see that I created some help, a, a helper function that allows me to easily generate these symbol layers. I set the offsets, I set the primitive name and the color, and then I can get back, um, get back my, my symbol layers to build these symbols. So if I only do that, I'm just going to see, I'm going to see all six of these layers at once in my map, which is not what I want. They'll all be the same size. They won't mean anything. It'll just be this colorful cluster of circles and rings. So that's where the primitive overrides come in. I need to define overrides that allow me to specify what these circles mean for a particular county. And so let's take a look at this symbol again. So I have the primitive, uh, I have the symbol structure here. And then this giant object you see off to the right represents just one primitive override. This represents a primitive override for a positive change in Democrat votes. So what are the important bits to note? Right there, you, what I highlighted is the primitive name. So this allows me to know which primitive uh, or which symbol layer I'm targeting. Then there's the property name. Property name. The property name tells the symbol which which property are do you want to override and then you have this value expression info and what this does is this allows you to define an arcade expression 
to determine what the size should be. So the size, I could just return a simple number like 10 or 20, and all the symbols would, would be rendered with that number. But I want to use data to, to change the size. So I'm going to focus on this part that I highlighted here. And it looks really complicated, and in some ways it is, but it fundamentally, there's there's something pretty basic going on. I'm just looking at the votes from the previous year and the votes uh, for this year. So this particular case, it's looking at the change from 2012 to 2016. All I'm doing is calculating the difference between those votes. And if the change is positive, I want to use that number. If it's negative, then I'm just going to return zero. If I return zero, then the symbol layer won't display because there was a positive change. What you see below with this size factor, this, this when function in Arcade, what this is doing is it's allowing me to scale the size based off the data value. So um, if I look at these values here, this 40, 35, those are the, the base size values I want to use depending on the vote. So if the number of votes is greater than half a million, then it's going to render with a size of 40. And then if it's 100,000, it'll render with a size of 30. If it's anything in between that, I'm going to scale it appropriately, so on and so forth. The rest of the expression allows me to change the size by scale. And I'll show that to you when I show you the app. So as I pointed out before, that this if-else line here is really what's key. If there is a negative change in votes, basically that symbol layer will not display at all. And if there is a positive change, then it will display. And if I, and then in the opposite scenario, if I'm, if you see that snippet down below, this is what how this expression changes for the negative symbol layers. If there is a negative change, then I want to take the absolute value and use that to calculate size. So if you look at the image of this symbol now to the right, you can see what the computed sizes would be for this county, where there was an increase in 93,000 votes for the other category, so it would be a size of 10.82 for that scale, or 10.36 for a negative change. And you see that it's using the ring symbol because that symbol layer is knows that there is um, there's a change that's a negative. All right, let's go ahead and look at the app itself. I'm going to switch to this tab. So this is what what came of it. There, there's actually a lot more going on here, and I'll explain exactly what's happening. But you can now see this is the for the most recent 2020 election. You can see that uh, you can see each symbol for the state and whether there was an increase or decrease in votes for each party. I also shaded the states that swung or switched parties from the previous election. So these blue states are states that Biden won. Um, in 2020 that Trump had won in 2016. And as you zoom in, I'm going to add labels that will clearly indicate what the actual change was. If you want to see how a state, like more information about the state, I added this helpful pop-up, which allows me to see what was the total change in votes for each party, how much did, that, did each candidate uh, earn, or what share of the vote did they earn, how did that share change from the previous year? And what was the percent change? So you can the, this view of the map allows you to really dive into a lot of details. I did it on the county level as well. So you can see how a lot of the vote shifted Democrat in 2020. So if I zoom into Atlanta, this is what it looks like. We see huge increases in Democrat um, counts and general decreases in the share for Republican counts, although Trump did earn more votes in this election than he did in the previous one in these same areas. It's just that Biden outgained him significantly. So something that's difficult to see from this view, though, is, the, is how the actual result ended up looking. So I added a swipe widget. This allows me to show the actual totals for each party. So even though there was a significant increase in Democratic votes, I can still see that there was a significant number of Republican voters turning out in some of these areas, particularly in these rural areas outside of Atlanta. What's also cool about this map is that I can change to another year. 
So if I look at 2016, you can see that the third party turnout actually mattered quite a bit in a lot of areas. Wisconsin flipped Republican, Iowa did, Michigan did as well. And it was not only due to an increase in third party votes, but you saw significant decreases in votes for Democratic candidates. So this map allows you to explore various years. You can see uh, that shift on the on the county level. This is my favorite view. It's you see how it changed. So in 2008, there was a big blue wave in 2012. It wasn't so much a, a red wave. It was just that a lot of people didn't show up to vote. And then 2016, you see a lot of third party voters came out. And then in 2020, a lot of Democratic and Republican voters showed up. So you see really interesting patterns through a, vi a visualization like this. And as I stated before, this isn't necessarily the best visualization. It just allows you to kind of unearth some details and stories that you might not have otherwise noticed. So with that, I would like to thank you for watching this session and encourage you to please provide your feedback by clicking on the session survey di directly below the video. And in behalf of Anne, Russ, myself, and others on the JavaScript team, I would like to thank you for watching this session and encourage you to try some symbols out in your own apps and share what you've learned and uh, show us the maps that you've made. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for joining us today. We're now gonna get started with the live Q&A portion of the session. So Christian and I are here to answer all your questions. Um, before we get started with that though, I just wanted to say thank you for participating in our polls. It really helps us get um, feedback on like, on, and know what you guys are actually using about these sim symbols. Um, so for those of you who said that you were already using data-driven multi-part symbols, I would love if you would reach out to me and ask our experts um, and sh share, share those symbols that you're creating. All right, so now we'll get to the questions. Um, so the first question, is it possible to use sim effects on 3D shapes and geometries with a Z component? For example, if I have a line geometry, I would want it to show as a checkered cylinder of a certain radius, um, would that be achievable using sim? So, so sim symbols are not supported, um, sim lines and polygons are not supported in 3D yet, um, but it is supported in, with points. So your example with a line geometry would not be possible currently, but if you wanted to do something similar with points, that would be possible. All right, next question. Um, does the JavaScript API fully support the SIM specification? Do you wanna take that, Christian? Sure. Um, no, it doesn't. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not fully, uh, I, if I'm perfectly honest, I don't know exactly what it doesn't support. Um, I know that the SIM spec, for example, has uh, like support for charts and like chart symbols, like pie charts. Sometimes people want to render a pie chart for their features. We don't support that currently, for example. And we don't, unfortunately, we don't really document the limitations very well, um, but we support most things. There's just certain um, effects that we don't. Um, so yeah, not so some other things that we don't currently support, but we're working on um, a gradient fill and um, gradient stroke. So that's something that we're researching right now. Um, but yeah, we try to dock the limitations, but the SIM spec is very large. Um, so it will take us some time to get to full parity, but um, we're working our way there. Yeah, right. the, the pro team, or they're the ones that really started SIM and implemented it. So they've had a lot of, many years of, of developing that spec and implementing it. And we, we, we just need to catch up. We're getting there. <laughs> All right, uh, next question. Can you guys please extend the SIM symbol builder for polygons and lines? Um, this is something that is on our radar. Um, we, we can start working on that. And I think I personally love using the SIM symbol builder. I think it's a really great way to create symbols. So I think that support for lines and poly polygons would be really awesome. So we'll work on that. Next question. Will SIM symbols draw faster than picture marker or PNG symbols 
for a point feature layer with a few hundred features? Um, the answer here is that they, they should have a similar performance unless you are adding like 10 symbol layers compared to like one picture marker symbol, then I would recommend using the picture marker symbol, but otherwise it should be pretty similar performance wise. Um, next question, do you have any recommended tools that can generate or convert existing graphics to the SIM marker symbol coordinate system? Do you want to take that one, Christian? Yeah, sure. Um, so as far as doing it, I mean, when it comes to like generating them or converting them to just SIM symbols themselves, I, I don't have one off the top of my head. Something that we do, um, we have used frequently is like Adobe Illustrator. You can um, create or bring in um, symbols there and then export them as web styles and if you ever need to tweak them uh, all the coordinates are are there available in the style json and you can modify them there but i i know illustrator is is a common one that we've used internally to to create and modify symbols so that's probably the one i would recommend if you're familiar with with that software yeah and as russ demonstrated you can kind of create your own symbols in pro and then publish them as web style symbol um, and then use that in your javascript apps so great question. Next up, um, may I know if sim symbol can be exported and referred by CAD drawing? Can I create a custom dictionary and use it in all ArcGIS platform? For example, ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS JavaScript API. And as someone, as some symbols cannot be resolved in the vector tile creation process, is sim symbols a solution to this? So that seems like three different questions. So we'll start with the first one about CAD, do you wanna take that, Christian? Yeah, so the, I'll just right off the bat, um, I don't believe so, but I'm also not sure. That's something that I would ask someone in the pro team and the ask our experts section is um, that you have, uh, you have like CAD drawings that you wanna to export to. They would be more familiar with that. We don't have any utilities in the JavaScript API for that. So I would say uh, no here, but there, there might be something from the pro team. Um, so I'll, I'll refer you over there. Awesome. Next part of that question is, can I create a custom dictionary and use it in all ArcGIS platform? For example, ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS JavaScript API. Yes, you can. Um, so if you create a custom dictionary, you can use the dictionary render in the JavaScript API to um, use that custom dictionary in your apps. And as some symbols cannot be resolved in the vector tile creation process, is sim symbols a solution to this? I would say the same thing as above. I would go to the pro team uh, for that. I would think so, but um, if if you're already doing that in the pro workflow, then there might be some other limitations to be aware of there. Um, I know that you know when it comes to publishing layers. Um, that we downgrade symbols, but that's a slightly different workflow. So I, I refer you over to them. Uh, I'm, I'm just don't know the answer. All right, thank you. Um, next question, can you use these instead of symbols in ArcGIS Pro before caching the base map? Do you know that one, Christian? Yeah, same, I would, I would go to the Pro team, um, but I just wanna point out that the symbols in ArcGIS Pro are sim symbols, uh, so um, I, I would go to the pro team with a little more detail and ask them uh, about that workflow. Next question, is there a maximum number of symbol layers I can set on a sim symbol? Um, I'll take that one. Not that we are aware of, um, but if you run into it, if you run into a maximum, let us know. Uh, I mean, I feel like at some point you don't wanna keep adding layers because then you won't be able to see your symbol anymore, but. Yeah, um, we haven't run into a maximum yet. Next question, does SIM Sympology support arrows in the middle of lines? Um, the answer is yes. And I posted a link to a sample in the reply of that question. Um, there's another CAD question. We already kind of answered that. Um, will SIM symbol be rendered faster than simple TTF? Do you know what, you wanna take that one? 
I don't know the answer to that question either. I feel sorry, and I feel so useless right now. Um, no, it's okay. I feel like I'm just I throwing you all the hard answers. I'm, I'm guessing that's referring to uh, true type fonts, but I don't. Um, oh, okay. I don't know. Um, I don't think. I mean, sim and rendering faster than other things is not necessarily. It's most of the time it's not the case because we have like basic symbol primitives, for example. And those will definitely render faster than sim. So um, I'm not sure. I, we'd have to take a look at that use case specifically um, in, in the Ask Your Expert section. I'd refer you there as well. Good question, okay. though. Um, and then next up, do you know if there is an icon picker component or a widget for sim symbols that we so we can use to generate the symbols on the web? Um, no, not not really. There is that sim symbol builder that I demonstrated earlier. Um, and then in the map viewer beta, um, there is a component that um, they use there to draw sim symbols in their maps um, to symbolize the layers. Um, and in the upcoming release of the new map viewer, there will be a sketch capability that will be using sim symbols um, there too. So. Yeah. Um, that's all the questions that we got. Um, please feel free to keep asking us questions. Um, do you have anything you want to talk about, Christian? Yeah, I just want to quickly look at the the polls for a second. So um, this um, this, we asked this question, would complex multi-part data-driven symbols, that's a mouthful, sorry, be useful to you in your work? And um, and that that's something, so basically the majority of you answered yes, you haven't really tried it yet or you don't know. Um, I just want to reiterate what Anne said earlier when she opened the, the Q&A session that uh, if the, you have ideas of different multi-part symbols where you want to make kind of some complex data-driven visualization, please reach out to us. You can email us, you can contact us at the Ask Our Experts and talk us through your, your workflow because we're very interested in that sort of thing and we want to help where we can. Um, as I said in that election demo, for example, um, those visualizations are kind of hard to understand at first, right? You have to really look down at the legend and try to understand it or um, it takes some exploring and so, um, I, I guess that there's kind of this, this very delicate balance between um, getting the best visualization versus one that's too complicated. And a lot of times the more complicated ones I think are the more most fun to build, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best for the audience. So um, I've had a number of conversations recently with, with some of you about some of these ideas. And so I'm excited to try them. I'm excited to, to see where we go with them. Um, so if there's if, if you have ideas for multi-part symbols, uh, then I would love to hear them. And Anne would too. So yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> good as both. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to, to kind of end on that. So please don't, don't be strangers, um, reach out. And so we can um, have a good meaningful dialogue to support what you guys need. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much.